Chair Dyack? Chair Dyack. Chair Dyack? Sounds like we're playing a uh, tag or something. Get ready when you Ch are. Chair Dyack? Dyack. Bob Pfeiffer, are you on the phone? Dyack. <laughs> Jim Dale, congratulations, Bob Pfeiffer. Right. Wow. All right. Wow. That is, that's loud. <laughs> All right. Uh, it's uh, 401. I'd like to call to order the Wednesday, November 6th um, work session. Right. Board work session? Yes, sir. I was talking about MVIC uh, earlier today with oh, former Commissioner Hilbert, and uh, it got me rather, nice rather misty. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So uh, we call to order. Are there any, is there anybody on the phone that would like to recognize themselves? Yeah, we're lots of us on the phone. It's Jessica Sandgren. Joan Peck. Joan. Joan Peck? Yep. Thank you. Is there anybody else other than Joan on, on the phone? Lynette, Jacob Jessica Lanier. Sandgren. Jessica Sandgren, thank you. Is there one more? Lynette. Lynette, thank you. Kirby Hey, Karina, we have Karina, thank you. Anybody else? Jim Dale. Jim Dale. Hi, Jim. Hi, Jim. Thank you. Good. Anybody else? Jacob LaBeer. Jacob, thank you for uh, phoning in. Anybody else? Oh, great. We, get, we got everybody. All right. Um, Let's see the next uh, summary board work session. We got public comment. Uh, the chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before the board of directors. Is there public comment tonight? Seeing none, we will move on. Uh, item four, briefing on the Mile High Compact 2.0 question mark. Mr. Yes. Calvert. Good afternoon, evening, even though it's, it is, looks dark outside. It almost feels like evening, even though it's not, uh, to those in the room and, and on the phone uh, as well. Uh, so thank you again. So Brad Calvert, uh, I'm the director of the Regional Planning and Development Division uh, here at Dr. Cog. Uh, tonight's presentation, and I would just say you have an actually really interesting agenda. There are three, pardon? Go for it, yeah. Well, no, sorry, Brad, real quick. I, I just wanted to preface this conversation this evening about what it is, and Brad will get into the details here in a minute. Um, and it's really, it's a readout in some respects through the, our board workshop that we had back in August, some of the conversations we had associated with that. Um, you all know that, you know, we, we uh, um, uh, participated in a Mile High Compact 20 years ago, and we thought there was an opportunity here associated with the MetroVision plan with our latest Metro Vision plan to have a discussion with the board. Um, and really, we, it is our expectation that this initiative, if it is indeed an initiative and goes forward, um, and uh, that this is going to be a uh, board-driven activity. We don't anticipate this is gonna be staff-led, staff um, but we truly wanted to provide an opportunity for you guys to, to, to discuss issues, uh, the objectives within our Metro Vision plan that you think are uh, important enough that should be elevated that we believe that collectively we could have we could have a larger impact than maybe just doing some things at the at the um, um, you know at the, at the more local levels so um, so really that's what it is um, you know whether it ends up being uh, a mile high compact and passed through resolution by you know, by your individual councils that's yet to be determined but we're we're a long ways away in that discussion but i think what we'd like to hear today is just basically is a readout from brad and just some some thoughts about um where you'd like to go with this so with that i'll turn it back to brad and that concludes my presentation no uh, <laughs> uh, uh, for, right. for those on the phone again this this is brad calvert director of regional planning and, uh, and development um and doug is exactly right 
Really, we're just sort of viewing this as a readout and kind of the beginnings of a next step uh, conversation. I know there were uh, a fair number of folks uh, that were at the uh, board workshop in, in August that maybe missed uh, this session. They had to scoot out a little bit early. We probably had 20 or 25 folks in the room that participated uh, in this conversation. But we obviously understand that that's not everyone. And, and, and Doug is exactly right. This is very much just an early conversation uh, that we want to make sure and put in front of you and get some, some initial uh, reactions. Uh, so the board workshop was not really the first opportunity that the board had a conversation on this topic or at least maybe heard information. Uh, one of the things that we did prior to that is I came uh, to the board work, uh, the re regular board meeting in August uh, on the 21st and really kind of gave an overview of the original MetroVision plan. Um, this organization exists to create regional plans and for the last really 20, 25 years, it has been under that uh, uh, heading of, of MetroVision. So mid 90s, uh, a lot of conversation in this region about the future and where we wanted to be in the year 2020. And given that we're almost there, it feels like a natural time to reflect on what we've accomplished and what there is still uh, left to do. Um, and so much like uh, the MetroVision plan that, that you all spent a fair amount of time talking about over the last couple of years, the MetroVision 2020 plan was adopted uh, to really sort of preserve the quality of life uh, while also positioning the region to benefit from growth. That was sort of the, 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 the core uh, belief and conversation that was happening um, at that time. And as this is a slide that was actually used at the workshop, but I think it's an, the question mark is really important and Doug was sort of alluding to this. No one, not Doug, not me, is suggesting that this is the path that we have to go uh, down, but it's a fair, it's, it's, a, it's a good time to ask ourselves, uh, the region has adopted unanimously, mind you, a, a regional plan. Uh, what is the conversation that we want to have related to both individual and collective initiatives to help advance uh, the outcomes in, in that plan? So that's really kind of the conversation uh, that we're, we're, ha we're having and had at the board uh, workshop uh, back in August with really maybe that middle bullet in the blue box being kind of an important point. We're not in the point where we're asking, do we need a new mile high compact or a revised compact? It's asking ourselves, where are we in this conversation? How might we begin to think about this a little bit so we can bring more information and more clarity uh, to this topic uh, to the board to have even maybe hopefully a more, uh, a more solid conversation on this topic uh, going forward. So if you're at the workshop, some of this will feel relatively fam familiar. Uh, so I'll do my best to kind of hurry along, but obviously not leave behind those that maybe weren't there. Um, just a little bit of, in the sort of overview of what the Mile High Compact is and what it, what it since uh, set out to accomplish. Uh, by and large, I would describe it as it, it's, it, it attempted to set the bar for local comprehensive plans in our region um, with really this idea that the region had, had created a regional plan. Uh, so therefore, let's figure out how to connect local plans to that, to that adopted uh, regional vision. It did include some specific topics. Uh, notably the urban growth boundary, urban growth area program, and really it's best to think of it as an intergovernmental agreement between the local governments and the Denver region. Uh, an important sort of sometimes maybe overly legalistic uh, note, uh, but Dr. Cog is not a party to that agreement. It really is amongst and, and, and between uh, the local governments in the region, but Dr. Cog is obviously implicated in supporting uh, the work and the conversation that is laid out uh, within, the, within the compact. Uh, so what was the board's motivation uh, at the time, uh, sort of going back uh, to, to the mid 90s uh, with really actually growth expectations that far outpace even sort of our 30 year view of how much we're gonna grow over the next 30 years. It was even a larger sort of expectation of growth that frankly we've experienced um, in the 90s than it is even today. So this notion that we're experiencing unprecedented growth in this region right now really isn't uh, reality. It was really kind of the heyday of the 90s that this region was experiencing tremendous, tremendous growth that the board was trying to wrestle uh, with how to, how to accommodate uh, that in the best possible fashion. And so the map that you see on the on the screen uh, is uh, a project that we worked on at Dr. Cog at the request of the board to stitch together what was the local sort of vision uh, individually for how this region was going to grow and accommodate 1.3 million people over 30 years sort of dating back to the mid 1990s and the result was uh, consuming uh, or having a total urban footprint of over a thousand square miles in our region and the board at the time 
sort of ask the open question, is that a tenable and acceptable future or do we want to think more about this? And the answer was yes. Uh, and so that was through uh, not only the Metrovision plan, but the Mile High Compact and even the Urban Growth Boundary uh, Program as a specific initiative to, to help uh, advance uh, the goals the, the board laid out in, in Metrovision. So I'm gonna do a very quick shorthand of what is in uh, the Mile High Compact as it exists today. Um, and again, the blue is sort of, to me, kind of the key uh, points. I'm probably excerpting maybe 10% of all the verbiage that you would see if you looked at uh, the entire compact, but recognizing that the growth and development decisions can impact neighboring jurisdictions and the region. Uh, Metrovision 2020 provides that framework, I sort of alluded to that, for uh, local decisions uh, on growth. So then kind of your whole series of now, therefore, and, and whereas is, um, you know, Metrovision 2020 as the comprehensive guide. Uh, you know, we signatories to this agreement agree to develop and approve comprehensive master plans for each of our respective communities. Uh, and there was a whole list of things that are sort of agreed to to be included within those comprehensive plans, but but notably from a very specific initiative uh, perspective that maybe is a really kind of where Dr. Cog comes into the picture, uh, is that local communities that signed on to this agreed to adopt urban growth areas and urban growth boundaries within those uh, comprehensive plans, and that the conversation about modifica modifications to either individual or regional uh, assumptions about growth through those uh, growth boundaries and growth areas, uh, there would be a regional dialogue around those conversations. So in some ways that points to, to Dr. Cog's role um, in that conversation. So again, I understand that's a lot of shorthand, uh, ultimately resulting in uh, about 45 uh, jurisdictions within the region becoming uh, signatories to the agreement, something like 90 or 95 percent of the population is covered uh, by jurisdictions uh, that agreed uh, to that original Mile High Compact. So now, I know that's a lot of history and very quickly, but sort of now looking, looking forward, um, for those that were involved uh, with the Metrovision conversations, you probably saw this, this uh, triangle too many times to count, but it's an important reminder about our overall strategic approach uh, here at Dr. Cog. Really kind of that Metrovision plan kicks in at that level that's um, overarching themes and outcomes, right? That is our statement of our desired future. Uh, so the Metrovision plan includes 14 outcomes that are that statement of a desired future and those objectives are the things that are, con are continuous improvement activities. What we can we continue to work on that will ultimately allow us to achieve and realize those outcomes? And initiatives that are exactly what they sound like. They're really kind of projects and programs that really, again, support our ability to not only sort of move in the direction that we want to move from an an, at a, the objective level, but again, achieve uh, those outcomes. Uh, so these are, these are those sort of overarching themes, and I think the important part of this conversation is that everything that I'm going to lay out for you from this point on, as well as what we talked about at the workshop, Metrovision is the starting point for this conversation. Um, the conversation that we've tried to stoke so far is not being pulled by, from wherever. It is being pulled from, again, a plan that was unanimously adopted by the board back in 2017 and reviewed a couple times in the, in the, in, in the years uh, since. And, and the plan, um, again, based on really kind of the guidance from, from you all, but also sort of consistent uh, thinking about what we are trying to accomplish through the Metrovision plan over the, over the last few decades, really recognizes that individual communities will contribute to Metrovision outcomes and objectives. That we, we, we achieve this plan uh, through uh, collective impact, whether that's, I think the images on the slide are Castle Rock, Lone Tree, Decono, Lakewood, and Louisville, all of those communities and every community in this region has an opportunity uh, to contribute uh, to the region's plan. So again, I just described this um, at, at the workshop, but staff, um, even, you know, Doug is right, we're, we can't lead this necessarily, but we can at least help you along the way. We thought it was important to maybe do a little bit of an assessment of, of the plan uh, as it exists today as our, as our starting point and try to sort of think through um, those objective level uh, options that are laid out in the plan where, again, as I mentioned before, where sort of those in continuous improvement activities are, are needed. And we kind of went through this sort of screening process where we were looking for objectives where both regional and local commitments would probably be necessary to achieve not only moving in the right direction, but, but ultimately that outcome. And we're really looking for places where um, maybe there is not an active or fully developed program here at Dr. Cog to help identify and, and wrestle to the ground uh, that issue and to ultimately provide support uh, to local governments that are looking uh, to make progress um, on the plan through individual action. 
And so I'll, I'll share with you what that screen um, looks like. But again, I'll just I'll remind uh, the folks that weren't in the room. When, when we asked the board to sort of work through the prioritization exercise at the workshop using paired comparison, which many of you have, have used in, in other venues, including uh, in some other conversations um, here, uh, particularly at, at the workshop, we this was the framing question that we wanted folks to, to think about is, thinking of the entire region, which options would provide the greatest opportunity for local governments in the region to contribute uh, to the success of MetroVision, resulting in collective impact for the region? And one of the things that was talked about in August that I think is an important point to bring forward is um, everything in the plan is important. Like that, that, that is staff and our stakeholders working assumption is that the board adopted something and said, all of this is important to us. So this, this is not a prioritization conversation that results in something being less important. It's the thing that maybe is something that we could really emphasize in our work program and how we support uh, the work that you're trying to do locally uh, that maybe isn't quite all the way there from a um, support uh, 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 approach. So what ultimately happened at the workshop is um, we spent some time, the board spent some time prioritizing uh, eight uh, objectives and I'll kind of shorthand uh, you again, these are all pulled uh, directly from the plan, sort of this notion of age-friendly communities. How do we create places that work for, for everyone? Uh, this notion of priority growth areas. How do we as a region agree to uh, the places where we will prioritize growth going forward and, and presumably the uh, infrastructure investments that might be needed to support that growth? Thinking about how water and growth are connected to, to one another. Uh, protecting our natural resources. And again, these are all objectives straight from the plan, sort of shorthanded down to hopefully catchy uh, titles. This notion of resiliency, how do we become a place that is not only prepared for disasters, uh, but responds as quickly as possible when they, when they occur. Uh, improving access to health services, recognizing that one of the things that's important to this region is the health of our population, um, both from an economic development perspective as well as from an overall community well-being uh, perspective. How do we deliver um, on that, that promise? Thinking about housing options for everyone um, in our region and then this notion of access to opportunity. Recognizing that we live in a, in a region that is highly amenitized and offers a lot of opportunities for people to climb uh, the economic ladder. How do we make sure that, that that happens as often as it possibly can? So for those that were in the room, you recognize you went kind of through that pairwise comparison. If you haven't done that, basically what that means is you're comparing all eight of those to each other through, through this very elongated sequence of making sure every one of those eight is compared uh, to each other. And this is sort of what the result was. So this is kind of the readout uh, portion uh, of the conversation. Uh, really kind of, there's sort of a, a pretty natural split. Um, really, this idea of improving access to health services, housing options for all, age-friendly communities, and access to opportunity, in some ways kind of rose to the top. I know you see that access to opportunity and water, water and growth um, were sort of tied in terms of rank. But there was a conversation in the room that like, access to opportunity is really, really important. Uh, even though that sort of fell in the sort of rankings, it should actually be something that we think about in this conversation holistically. And really, if you look at the items that sit above it in the rankings, in some ways, they're all tied back to that, right? Health is something that we want people to make sure that they have access to health services, whether that is traditional health care or community-based organizations that can uh, improve health outcomes. Housing is ultimately tied uh, to, to opportunity to make sure people have access to housing. And age-friendly communities is, again, making sure as people uh, age in our region, they have access to the services, programs, and infrastructure that allows them to thrive and give back to the community. So even though it felt like it was called something different, you could find it in the things that were ultimately ranked above it based on the, the comparison. Uh, and so then what happened uh, at the workshop was sort of a series of conversations uh, with, with the board, board members talking uh, to each other about kind of the initiative level of this. So again, we wanted, and the goal was not to come up with the absolute set of initiatives that might be the basis of, 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 a, of a new uh, collective impact agreement. It was to largely just sort of think through what would these things look and feel like um, just going forward so that we can begin to sort of understand again what that initiative level commitment uh, might look like from a local community uh, perspective. So for the, for the topics or the objectives that really kind of um, were uh, sort of fell to the, arose to the top in terms of the rankings, uh, uh, board directors spent time talking about those initiatives. So for instance, on the improving um, access to health services, uh, this idea of uh, changing zoning to encourage connected services in priority areas, I have thought of that as uh, the concept I use is wellness districts to sort of think about from a planning perspective, how do you co-locate 
uh, health services, whether that's traditional healthcare uh, uh, sector uh, partners or other um, health serving uh, uh, land uses and development patterns, to um, thinking about sort of collaborative healthcare and info sh uh, information sharing, focusing on transportation access to make sure people can actually access the health services that are available uh, in their community. Um, the housing options for all um, talked about, you know, a lobbying approach uh, to to make sure there is um, a, a access to uh, low-income housing tax credits, which obviously are an important part of our ability to build uh, housing and add affordable housing to our region's portfolio. Um, I, you know, the, a notion of adopting a, an affordable housing plan with a menu of strategies and and a, a goal for the entire region. Uh, this idea of access to opportunity, and I kind of mentioned this already, is like recognizing that that maybe is a lens that should be applied universally in our thinking through um, kind of what this agreement is trying to, to accomplish. So that's really kind of everything that happened uh, through sort of August 24th. Uh, and I'll give you kind of maybe a few uh, teasers on maybe where this could go and really maybe some feedback as to what we're looking for uh, from you all uh, this evening. As, as Doug mentioned, I'm doing my best, and frankly, I don't know if I have the time, to really like go all in and charge this. I really wanna hear from, from, from you all this evening about maybe giving us a little bit of direction. I've been doing what I would call super light due diligence, almost to kind of get my head around this a little bit more based on the conversations that we've had um, uh, so far or the board has had so far. Um, so I've had, there's actually some things on here that have happened that uh, the, the check marks um, aren't there yet because they've happened between the packet going out and today. Uh, I've had an interview, so I, I, there are some peers of ours that are doing kind of similar work. Uh, and so I'm reaching out to sort of find out a little bit more about what they're working on. So even though this doesn't get the check mark, uh, I did talk to um, our peer in Washington, D.C. about a re their board took action in September of this year on um, uh, sort of an, an ambitious regional housing target to basically produce more affordable housing and frankly more housing overall than their current forecast is calling for. Um, ultimately in that region, they are not producing the housing that they need to create an affordable product throughout the region. So the board stepped in and said, uh, we wanna produce 75,000 more units over the next 10 years than we are forecasting. We want 75% of those 75,000 units to be affordable or attainable to low and moderate income households. And we want 75% of that 75,000 to be located in transit enabled places. So they're saying above and beyond kind of our current assumptions, this is our commitment. And that's a regional scaled uh, commitment. And now they're sorting through what would the local commitments um, look like to, to make sure that that's something they can achieve in 10 years, a very, very short time frame. There's some other sort of things that, again, our peers have been working on that I kind of did mostly want to learn about, sort of fig figure out if there is some application to to our region. Uh, one other thing that, that did happen over the last couple of weeks is um, uh, I don't see Director Olson or Director Sutton, who I know are involved um, in this work at DU, but um, DU is working on uh, a Grand Challenges Collective Impact uh, conversation uh, through a, a variety of topics. And just knowing that they're having this conversation about collective impact, I reached out uh, to someone uh, who is a scholar on collective impact and runs uh, several law clinics within the law school uh, to, that really is focused on, again, collective impact agreements and just frankly picked her brain about what should we know about, about this work um, going forward. And frankly, she was super excited uh, that we were even having this conversation or thinking about having this conversation and, and was really ready to help any, any time now if there was an ask that would come to DU about how they might could support uh, this work going forward. But here's some other examples again of, of, of folks that I feel like are probably should be on my call sheet to, to learn a little bit more uh, about what they've been working on. So really tonight's conversation is, is really this slide. I need, we need uh, as staff maybe some guidance about sort of how this is landing on the board, uh, what our next steps ought to be, and I don't know if that is direct next step guidance or maybe bigger picture process uh, type guidance to kind of give you a little bit of background, which frankly I didn't even know until I started to put this presentation together. Uh, the, the, the existing Mile High Compact went from a draft to signed by an initial set of uh, local governments in four months. And that blew my mind, uh, having spent six years trying to get to an adopted Metro Vision plan. And I don't know what was in the sauce then that allowed that to happen, other than one thing I know is that really Metro Mayor's caucus kind of took the leadership role there. And go ahead, Mayor. Well, 
Uh, <laughs> so it was sauce, very sauce. Uh, so, I mean, so just stepping back from this, I guess the question that came to mind for me, and this is just my question, but I, I'm hopeful that maybe this has sparked uh, some of your thinking is, does the board prefer to be the primary designer, drafter, evaluator, and marketer of a new agreement? And I don't mean that all the way to, yes, we are doing this. It's more like the steps leading up to asking ourselves, is this something that we want to do now that we know a little bit more about it? Or is there interest in invol involving other organizations? From, from a process standpoint, to continue our due diligence, your due diligence on this topic, what makes you feel comfortable? Uh, what makes you feel like the process would be most successful? Anything else kind of in this space that again, kind of gives Doug and, and myself maybe a little bit of guidance about what we should be uh, chasing so that we know when we bring something back to you, you're gonna feel uh, like it is something that you can continue uh, to have productive conversations around. All right. Thank you, Brad. Um, questions, comments? Director Williams. Brad, could you talk a little bit, so for cities that already have, communities already have comprehensive plans, can you talk a little bit how it's intended that this would interact with that? Obviously, we're not ceding authority for comprehensive planning over to Dr. Gog, not that I wouldn't. Correct. Uh, but, but can you talk about kind of the, how those interact? So I, I maybe will, I'll, I'll, I'm going to zig a little bit when maybe you're asking me to zag. Um, there's nothing that suggests that a revised version of this agreement has to mention comprehensive plans at all. Uh, that was the, the notion uh, dating back to the mid to late 90s, early 2000s, was that we all need to do as local communities, we need to have our own vision of how we are going to grow in the future, and we should all recognize that that should be tied to the regional vision that we work so hard uh, to construct and then laid out kind of a series of expectations that as we are doing uh, local comprehensive plans, these are the types of things that should be included in it. Depending on the, the topic or the objective that this group uh, feels like would potentially be the focus of an agreement, it might not even be in the space of local comprehensive plans. I mean, as a planner, I'm pretty convinced you could probably make a connection there either way, uh, but whether it would be actually sort of spelled out in the agreement is really about the objective and the topic that would be uh, sort of further enumerated uh, within that document. Director Atchison. I guess this was pretty well brought forward as, as you indicated by Metro mayors before and the executive committee is meeting tomorrow. The question is, do they want to try to spearhead it through the municipalities and to the counties again? Well, it hasn't um, been discussed. No, well, we, we, we've had conversations with staff, Metro Mayor's staff associated with this. Um, I think we've always anticipated that we would facilitate that discussion, and, and they, they, they're they certainly, you know, willing to have that conversation for sure. Um, it's just staff resources more than anything, to be honest with you. Um, but also, we're more inclusive too, right? I mean, we have the counties here as well, which is obviously beneficial. Um, you know, I just, I just think that this is, we're at a different place in time than what we were 20 years ago, right? There was different conversations and the like. And I just, I see this as an opportunity for us to have conversations and about certain issues. And I don't know particularly what, I mean, I probably do know what the, what the, you know, what those boiling issues are that maybe we can have a larger collective impact. But Brad's right, it might not have any association to the comprehensive plans within your communities at all. Um, but I'd be kind of curious to just, you know, get your take on some of those issues that you think, you know, as a group, we can we can work towards. I will just mention one, seeing I, I'm talking. <laughs> um, and I don't know how relevant this is, and I don't know how it would even work, to be quite honest with you, but I know, just as an example, something is, um, is homelessness. And I know there's been a lot of conversation. I know Adams County's doing some fabulous work. I know Arapahoe County's doing some work, and certainly the city, the city and county of Denver is. Is there opportunities, is there issues like that that you know, that collectively we could have a larger impact on, as opposed to just doing these individual, you know, per county, per city, whatever that might be. Just think of it kind of in that perspective. And again, I don't know what they are. Are you done, Doug? I, I'm done. Thank okay. you. I'm muting. I appreciate it, Dr. Brocken. Yeah, because it seems like you're really asking us two questions. One is, should we have some kind of replacement for the Mile High Compact, and the other is what would it cover, right? Because you're, you're sort of presenting us with, well, it might 
cover this or micro, we're not sure, right? So it, it does make it a, a little bit hard to figure out if we should have one if we're not sure what it would be about. Uh, but of course we do have burning topics to work on and uh, Doug, thanks for raising the homelessness issue which is a regional and, and national problem that we have that's very significant. Uh, but certainly housing uh, occurs uh, to me quickly as you know, people talk about an affordable housing uh, crisis in the Front Range. It's certainly uh, a major problem in Boulder, but all across the metro area. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, um, so that that could be one of those areas that we look at. Um, and of course, there's a nexus between housing and homelessness, obviously. Um, so, I, if if we if we were to think about undertaking as a region some kind of regional approach to housing, I I would be very much in support of that. And the Boulder County has done some great work uh, in that kind of area in the last couple of years. We just approved a Boulder County uh, regional mm -hmm. housing strategy that I thought was very productive. Mr. Jones? Well, just piggybacking on that, I think th the easier question to answer would be, do we want to work closely together on an initiative where we think we can have collective impact? I think, yeah, why not? That would be a great... Um, uh, opportunity that Dr. Cog could have. And I do think that affordable housing, particularly affordable housing as an overlay, is an issue that covers equity, it covers homelessness, it covers economic opportunity. I mean, it has, uh, and it's directly related to transportation as well, which we, we know and love. So I could definitely see signing up to, to, to look at how we could work together more closely and get our hands dirty on really going deep on a regional effort around affordable affordable housing or living. You know, that to me is very uh, intriguing idea. Whether or not that's a replacement for a mile high compact or what we call it, eh, I, I'm less, I have less of an opinion about that. Chairman? I, I, Lisa, I, I, mean, I do, I, th I think that's a great idea. I think affordable housing makes an awful lot of sense. And you're right, does it elevate to the necessity of a mile high compact? I don't know. But at least I think if we were to, you know, really beat down on that a little more and figure out exactly what some of the initiatives might be associated with that, maybe it does boil up to something a little more formal. But um, personally, I have a, you know, interest in the access to opportunities too. I'm, I'm intrigued by it. I, I'm intrigued by what the possibilities could be, you know, collectively as a region to do do something on that on that. So uh, I guess in terms of approach, um, should we be doing this ourselves as a board? Should we be engaging other people? Does anybody have any thoughts? I think that was one of the questions. Brad has. Director Henry, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's okay. It was Kevin who's stopping me from talking. You know, sorry, I, was, I was looking at Brad. Damn Burn Adams, you know how we are. Um, I think we should as a board because this is the only organization that includes county commissioners and the municipalities in the region. And these are conversations that should be held by both counties and municipalities. Director Partridge. Uh, Sounds like it might be on anyway. Okay. Thanks, Ms. Chair. Uh, really think about what we've been through with MetroVision. I think we had a wonderful uh, working relationship and everybody involved, and that was unanimous. I really think that took us beyond what we expected. I, I really look at, I, I did question a need, and I really believe there should be a third question up there, and I think that's interesting. It's just, not do this at all. Because it's not federally required, it's not state required, it's not any requirement overall. And we have Metro Vision, which is a regional approach. What I don't want to lose is our local control, and that is the value that we all have. We all are so different. I think what we've done with the sub-regional tip is a perfect example where we didn't have regional control over a sub-region. We let the sub-regions go forward, but we had the ability to cross over lines, and I think it worked beautifully. So to be, come in and now say, really, open up MetroVision, this is what this is. Why? We already have unanimous decision on MetroVision. I look at this, 
I am fully agree in agreeing we have other issues. I look at mental health, and I'm going to take our mental health program we have in Douglas County, I think is one of the best in the state, maybe in the country, what we've done with mental health. But it's not mandated. I've cautioned our administrators when it comes to the state level, always have to push back in the state legislature because we get unfunded mandates from the state legislature. When that comes down to mental health, they think it's all great. And they mandate, but the state doesn't do mental health. It is being held up to we, the cities and counties, and we are doing that. I think we have that collaborative approach, but I would not like us to see be bound by any other document, any other signed document. I think we already have it. We have Metro Vision. So I would be in favor to say there should be a third question up there and saying, not approach it in this, but we continue to have those conversations around those many topics, whether it's affordable housing, whether it's jobs. Uh, and I'm going to throw in there affordable housing. We, we all know the grill in the room. It's not a grill in the room. It's right there. It is called construction defects. That is what will cure affordable housing to the greater degree more than anything. So I think we have those issues before us. I would not be in favor of bringing forward another mile high compact. Any other thoughts or questions? Anybody on the phone who would like to weigh in? Yeah, this is Joan Peck. Okay, Joan, could you please speak up a little bit? Yes, is that loud enough? Yep, sure. <laughs> okay, so um, as I'm listening to this, I agree with the last speaker on, on a lot of what he said, but I think it's really important to pay attention to the comprehensive plans of each municipality. Because even though we have a regional uh, goal, whether it's homelessness or affordable housing, it hits each municipality differently. And when we do comprehensive plans within the municipality, it's because it directly affects that city. Um, I have problems sometimes with a county mandate or directive that doesn't solve a, a central problem. So if we move forward on this, I think that the regional needs to take the comprehensive plans of each municipality, see what we're addressing, see where the holes would be in the regional plan. Um, so that's it, that's my comments. <laughs> Thank you, Joan. Mayor-elect Stolzman. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Um, I, I just sort of wanted to play off of some of the things that Director Jones was talking about, um, that I, I'm not sure it's necessary to have this Mile High Compact 2.0 or what format to take, but it seems like there is an opportunity to have collaboration around different issues. And I think there, there is something um, aspirational about having very short time periods where people can come together, share ideas, and figure out something. So I think we could use that as uh, sort of a lesson, in, sometimes in technology and in other settings, they call them scrums where you get together and do something quickly. But it seems like there's an opportunity to share ideas. Like I, I'd be really interested to understand more about what Douglas County is doing for mental health. Maybe there are things that we could implement in Boulder County um, and just learn the lesson from that. So even though it's not transportation, which is what we focus on a lot here, there could be a real opportunity for us to learn from another community. I think there's also opportunity. Um, we've, we've been given a lot of local control in this last session around um, things like wages and um, smoking age and things like that. And it would be nice to talk regionally about what other people are planning on doing. We might not all agree, but it would be nice to understand what's everyone doing. Are there groups of people who want to work together collectively? Are there, uh, because there are some incentives in some of the ways that they run the legislation. So there might be um, pockets that would want to work together in other areas that would want to opt out. But I think having a forum for those dialogues on a variety of topics could be really useful. Anybody else? Yeah, Jim Dale. Jim, go uh, ahead. I was thinking about better practices. To me, it would seem that Dr. Cog could play a role in the whole area of affordable living um, for collecting better practices across the nation and these discussions with other uh, metropolitan planning organizations where then we could come back and have the discussions between cities, counties, or whatever because we, we work with many of these things, whereas aging or health care or transportation or food or homelessness. And if we just had some more, I 
additional ideas I think would be helpful. Okay. Anybody else? I'm sorry, Director Shaw. Hello, yes. Um, I guess my thought is, is also about um, we're here, we're members of Dr. Cog. If we were going to do a mile high compact, it seems to me that it would be on such a, a broad basis that we agree to tackle tough problems or discuss tough problems that may range from housing to health to natural resources, even though that was at the bottom of the list. Um, or, or maybe not even specify the types of things that we might discuss. I mean, and so when you get to that level of generality, I'm not even sure that that the compact itself would add value. Um, but I, I, I think this is a wonderful forum to discuss the tough issues and to share best practices because we all face a different type of, um, you know, um, situation around maybe housing or health, uh, including mental health. So um, understanding the opportunities can benefit all of us. I, I, I guess I, I just struggle with um, other than being a member of this organization, what else we would commit to through the compact? Director Atchison. I want to go back to a piece that the bottom bullet, what other organizations, and going back to Roger's point, one of the stymies of affordable housing, not so much that we can't keep chipping away at construction defects, which we do every year, don't make any big jumps. The biggest reason we don't make big jumps is the insurance industry is no longer at the table and has not been for two years. They're not willing to continue money into it because they're not making any headway. Until we get that group back at the table to talk with the municipalities and counties over what we're doing through plat notes or ordinances, however you're handling that, we're not going to make a big jump in builders and developers being able to come in and do it because right now in the last conversation I had with insurance anywhere from twenty to forty thousand dollars a unit for insurance that's pricing so much out of the affordable market that they won't play in it the other part is the availability of high tech and four percent and nine percent tax credits our, our availability is not getting any better it's getting worse in the competition for them, as we saw with Chaffa recently, you can expect to go through the application process anywhere from two to four times before your application will get serious consideration. And if you don't have a municipality or county involved in some level of the partnership, that puts you back down to the bottom of the list again. There's people like Chaffa, the tax credits, and the insurance industry. We don't have them at the table talking with us about affordable housing, we're not going to get anywhere. Dr. Jones. Yeah, I just wanted to respond to some of the things I was hearing. I guess what I see in this, certainly we can always learn from each other and, and we do that now and we should continue to do that. What I hear the staff asking is whether or not we want to do a more focused deep dive on a particular issue where we think by working together we can get farther than just each of us doing our own thing. And not so much that it's a binding thing or that we're going to mandate it on each other, but whether or not we voluntarily want to come together and do something synergistically. So not something to be scared of, but more is there an opportunity there for regional activity? And to me, um, you know, with all those caveats on, it's not something we're binding. I will say that the regional affordable housing plan that, that Director Brockett mentioned and that um, was up on the screen is something that that kind of thing could be a model where uh, Boulder County had a summit with the key stakeholders, but mainly the municipalities involved, and we decided 
after talking through it, that we wanted to send a regional, county-wide goal of a certain percentage of permanently affordable housing. We talked about the tool of, the menu of tools that local jurisdictions could use to do their part. Nobody was bound to use any particular one. Nobody was signing up for what particular percentage of the goal. But the collective action has helped with having our planners work together and identify the barriers that we have for approving affordable housing, um, uh, teaching each other about the best financing opportunities, um, talking about best practices around how do you engage the community in doing an affordable housing project that then isn't um, hated by the neighbors because they were a part of designing it, you know, so good outreach, things like that where we're collectively moving together and everybody opted in on their own accord, um, but it's just more synergistic. So I, I guess I'm throwing that out as I could see doing something like that with Dr. Cog. Dr. Henry. There's so much that we can learn from each other in regards to convening something like this. Um, I don't know what I don't know, and I think that's the way everybody should be looking at this when we're sitting down at the table and how much more we can learn from each other. And this, this is an issue, yes, we, we can put construction default out there, but this is an issue that when site selectors come into, into Colorado that they mention over and over and over and over again is attainable housing, workforce force housing, where are people, if I bring a company of 1,500 people in, where are they going to live? So this is affecting all our communities, and we have to start thinking outside the box instead of the way that we have been confined in the box with the conversation of construction defects. So yes, we need to still work on construction defects on the state level, and we should always continue to work on it, but it's like eating an elephant, it's a bite at a time. And while we're taking that very slow bite, we could be convening a conversation on how we can think outside the box and work with each other collaboratively to be able to solve a very serious issue that has gotten the entire region here, and it's stopping companies from coming into Colorado. Thank you, sir, very much. No, I, I, I know we got to move on, um, but I, I think this was a very good discussion for us, and I, I'm hearing, you know, a lot of the need about, you know, to continue that collaboration on some issues. I like the scrum idea. I would, I'm intrigued by what Boulder County is doing and the, and the potential that that, that has, and you said it better than, bit better than I could, Director Jones. I mean, I, this was never meant to be regulatory in nature, right? It's basically sharing information that you guys can, you know, set up a situation within your own communities um, to helpfully get to that larger collective impact. So we, um, you know, with your blessing, we'll continue to explore those and maybe even set up a, a couple and more of a deeper dive into, a, in, into some of these issues um, as we go forth now over the winter. So um, that's okay with you all, we'll continue that. Is there any additional feedback on what Doug said? No. I, I think I think taking the formality of the Mile High Compact 2.0 off the table and getting it down, I think, would be something good. Right. Right. Um, you know, as I was told coming into Dr. Cog, um, the discussions you have before and after the board meetings are just as important, if not more, than the board meetings themselves. And I didn't really realize that until you start having discussions. And if we can put those discussions in, in a more um, into more focus, which I think this is what this study session is all about, um, I think it'd be beneficial for everybody. Excellent. So, yep. all right. Thank you. Oh, Director Partridge. Thank you. A good example we've seen is the community profiles. I think it is wonderful because it has everybody the opportunity to show who they are, what they are, what they've accomplished. And when you see that, you're going, wow, that, that was impressive. And then you have the conversation on the side with that community. I think this leads to that same thing. Instead of having staff put time into a document per se, it's like have time put in to create that topic. So it's not that I'm negative on that, but it's like, want staff time to go into just creating a document. Extra work. We yeah. want it to be formative, and I think the community profiles show that. So we look at it, it's a focus on a 
agree, because this, this is the group, it, this is the whole region, and we do have so much to share. And I with that, that we just take a direction from the board instead of saying the board has to react to a staff created document. Anybody else on the phone who has final comments? Seeing none, uh, we'll move on. Next item, briefing on the wellness fund. AJ. Yeah. Uh, no. Uh, no. I, yes. I, I would have been right, but I don't want to be wrong. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, my name is AJ Diamantopoulos. Uh, I manage the Accountable Health Communities Program here at Dr. Cog. I'll tell you a little bit more about that in, in just a minute, but I'm going to give you a uh, a background on um, a lot of the same topics we just talked about, but from a different perspective. Uh, tell you about some of the issues that are coming down the pike uh, that are both uh, a tremendous compliment and a little bit scary, uh, and let you know uh, some of the plan we have to uh, work on um, uh, addressing those uh, fears. So first, um, your previous conversation is running through my head, and I'm uh, in the healthcare world, uh, beginning, I know you've seen this slide before, but beginning about 2011, a lot of uh, effort and interest went into uh, figuring out what actually is healthcare. Um, and as you see here, this is from a Robert Wood Johnson uh, report, a Robert Wood Johnson Foundation report. Um, of the modifiable factors in healthcare, 10% are impacted by clinical services, the things your clinician works with you on. 10% uh, are genes and biology. You might have heard your zip code is more important than your genetic code. 10% uh, is the physical environment. 30% are your health behaviors. Um, <laughs> do you drink and smoke like I wanted to just before this? Um, uh, and the other 40 are uh, social and economic factors. Um, those are the social determinants of health. Uh, in spending on health care, the United States is first. Yay, kind of. Um, as a percentage of gross domestic product, we spend 19% uh, of our GDP, that's both uh, government programs and private insurance, on clinical services. Uh, and we spend, I believe, 17% uh, um, uh, on social services. We are an outlier among uh, other developed nations. These are nations of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development. Um, and the key piece that you can't really show in a slide is that we are less healthy. Uh, by any measure, we are less healthy. Uh, and we pay the most. However, uh, starting in 2010, there's been a lot of efforts nationally in this country to figure out how to lower the cost of care. There's a lot going on at the state legislature, the national, well, there's not a lot going on there, but um, there was a lot of work done by uh, many uh, policy wonks, uh, foundations, including Robert Wood Johnson, Kresge, um, and, and the list goes on and on. And they created what they called Accountable Communities for Health. Um, and those were uh, just that, communities being accountable for their own health. Uh, CMS, uh, the center, excuse me, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, started working on this as well, and they created out of that the accountable health communities. I've learned branding is very important to the federal government, so they, they changed the words around. Um, and that is the program that we manage here at Dr. Cog. We're the only area agency on aging in the nation to get this award. We're the only Council of Governments to get this award. Um, I was here uh, at a board meeting in May of 2017 to tell you all about it. Uh, we screen people, Medicare and Medicaid beneficiaries, in clinical settings for one or more social needs. Um, housing, both homelessness and quality, so do you have mold, pests. Transportation, some of these might sound familiar. Um, utility needs, um, food security, and I always, and safety issues, interpersonal violence. Sorry, I always, 
been doing this a long time, I always blank on five. Um, interpersonal violence is both uh, child abuse, elder abuse, and domestic violence. So we use a standardized screener. If you have uh, one or more of those needs, we give you a, a community or a resource or referral to a community organization to help you address that. If you have one or more of those needs and you report that you have two or more emergency department visits, we offer you assistance to connect with those community organizations to help you address your health-related social need. That's gonna be a key piece. That referral is gonna echo in your ears for the rest of this uh, discussion. Because um, we're working to understand how addressing those needs in the community impacts the cost of healthcare. Everybody knows it goes, uh, it impacts it positively and that uh, things become more affordable. Uh, but also quality goes up. We don't know how or why, and we're working on that in the accountable health community. However, uh, it's, it's um, Jayla will be happy with me for saying this is a very big deal. The accountable health communities is being watched by a lot of people nationally. Uh, they're, they're watching it for every, every move. They're um, about to start the evaluation, and I just learned that instead of sending a quantitative analyst out to look at our databases, they're sending an anthropologist. Uh, not because I'm that interesting, but because um, the culture in healthcare and community-based services and state agencies is uh, changing, and it's about to impact us in a great way. We now uh, face some challenges, and those um, include the dramatic increase of referrals from clinical settings to community-based organizations. Uh, the state of Colorado is uh, being very proactive in addressing social determinants of health by referring people to community organizations. This is both a welcome and honest compliment and also um, a great threat to us, to be honest with you. We'll start with the hospital transformation program. Have any of you heard of the hospital provider fee? It's just $1.3 billion. Um, it is a fee, and it was designed with good intention. It's a great program. It, uh, Medicaid, as an insurance company, is the lowest payer. It, it pays the least for services, right? So to uh, help providers serve more Medicaid beneficiaries, they assess a fee on every hospital and every hospital bed that has somebody who's insured by Medicaid there for one night. So let's say that's a dollar. That fee is assessed by the state, it goes to the state. It is matched by the federal government, and then that match is the hospital provider fee. So now we've had, we have two dollars, and those two dollars are sent back to the hospital. So now they have a financial incentive to work with Medicaid beneficiaries. It's a, it's a pretty cool program. They are changing it. Um, instead of just saying, thank you for serving the Medicaid beneficiary, we're now going to ask you to meet certain, what they call quality metrics. These are standards of care. This is what you should be doing. Uh, things include uh, managing people's A1C if they have diabetes, uh, uh, reducing um, uh, emergency department visits. Um, and one of those measures that will be uh, impacting every hospital, there's 103 in the state of Colorado, is a statewide measure to um, incentivize screening and referral of Medicaid beneficiaries to community-based organizations. So now a portion of their $1.3 billion can be earned if they send these referrals. The second one is the social health information exchange. This, yes? Can we just, I, I wanna make sure everybody's on the same page with what exactly it is we do here with our, our AAA. It's like, so we are, we, we hand, so, so we, we contract with 35, soon to be 42 independent contractors to provide community-based services throughout this region, right? Transportation, nutrition, chores, those types of things. We do case management here ourselves. And what AJ is referring to, those referrals that are gonna come from, from the docs is going to exponentially increase. And we already have issues with funding those community-based services and there's already waiting lists. So the, the potential of, quite frankly, this collapsing on the back end is, is, is substantial. So I just want to make yeah. sure we're all on the same page with that. It's, it's not a potential, it's gonna happen. We will be inundated with referrals and 
but I'll, I was building up to that. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> The second piece that I, I want you to be aware of is um, uh, not only are they being incentivized to send these referrals, they're building uh, the IT infrastructure to send them very quickly and very easily in a hospital, in a primary care clinic, in a couple of years, they're building, well, they're building it now, but it's called the State Health Information Exchange. Have any of you heard of 211 or Network of Care here at Dr. Cog? It's, uh, it's basically the yellow pages online. I have a need, I start Googling, these resources come up and I can access them. What they're adding to that functionality is the ability to interact with their what they call their electronic health record. Have any of you been to the doctor in the past year? Have you ever noticed that they make very little eye contact with you, but they type all the time? Yes, it's, they're typing into their electronic health record. That's basically the paper file that they've digitized. They now make it possible to send e-prescriptions, so you're, you don't have to carry your prescription to your pharmacy, it's just there. Um, but that type of service is now going to be available to healthcare providers. Um, and they have fun, they've just been awarded the $64 million to the Governor's Office of eHealth Innovation. Um, that was matched by the federal government. So they're going to build a system that takes uh, a doctor who will then say, hey, it looks like you have a housing issue. Can I get you connected to a community organization to address your housing issue? If you say yes, they hit a button that could come to Dr. Cog, it could come to Brothers Redevelopment, it could come to uh, any other organization that works on housing. Again, that is a great thing. However, we're at capacity. We're, we have wait lists. We have the funding we get uh, to do our work and we do it quite well, um, but we're, we're there. Um, and they're about to, there's 1.3 million people on Medicaid statewide. Everybody 65 and over is on Medicare. They'll be party to the system. Private payers for the rest. Uh, they will all be uh, receiving referrals if they have one of these needs. And what we know from the accountable health communities is a lot of people have these needs. A lot. Thrive by Kaiser. I love Kaiser's commercials. Um, Allison Janney's voice is very nice. It's very pleasant. I want to join Kaiser, but Dr. Cog's insurance is pretty good. Um, they're they're a, a national organization. Um, they are rolling out Thrive by Kaiser. Uh, they have 68 million members nationally. They, ha they are the largest insurer in the state of Colorado. Um, they are building their own social health information exchange. So they will have their own resource directory with functionality to send referrals to community organizations. To lower their costs, they will earn a greater return. They're a nonprofit, so I can't say they will make uh, profit, but they will have, they will spend less because of community organizations. That is both a wonderful compliment and amazingly scary. Um, uh, as, as we've alluded to, just to give you a, a comparison, statewide, Medicaid has uh, spent $7.9 billion a year for 1.3 million people, and they're the lowest payer. They pay the least. The Area Agency on Aging uh, serves, uh, I think it's 19,000 people a year in our region alone. Um, and we do that with $46 million. We could serve a lot more than 19,000 if we had not just the extra funding to provide the services, but the infrastructure to handle the, uh, an evolution in our operations so that our staff can be equipped to deal with this massive tsunami of referrals that are coming. When I gave a version of this to some of the folks on Dr. Cog's staff, I asked if their hair was on fire. Anybody? Just me? Okay. Um, we have uh, started, but we need to engage more with these organizations and these initiatives. Uh, the Colorado Hospital Transformation Program, uh, the State Health Information Exchange, the State Medicaid Office, and Kaiser Permanente. Um, and we've uh, come up with a potential solution. I'd love to sit here and tell you that was my idea, but it was in no way my idea. I'm, uh, I'm cutting and pasting from other people's work. So can I back up to one sure. The hospitals get paid Kayla, you need a microphone. I can, I can, the hospitals get paid more money for sending these referrals to organizations that will now serve less or fewer people because of these referrals. And community organizations do not get paid. There you go. Okay, thank you. 
and, and the, the value of community-based services is both known and um, profound, and they want to utilize the services, but what they don't understand, because no one's ever thought to ask us, is that we don't have capacity. We, had, uh, we met with a chief medical officer at a health system who said, isn't it true that if I give you more people, you get more money? In healthcare, it's called fee for service. The more you do, the more you get paid. That's not how it works in community organizations. We get a set amount of money and we have to provide all the services we can. Um, because uh, we, are, we are now working to address this need, there are several uh, initiatives um, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me, let me tell you about the potential solution we've come up with, and it's the title. It's a wellness fund. Um, and I don't want you to think about, of it as a bank account. Um, it, is, it will hopefully be a fund of uh, both money, expertise, and uh, collective impact. Um, uh, as we conceive it now, it is a program designed to enable community organizations to meet the oncoming need of the marketplace. So if you think about it uh, this way, um, healthcare is about to send us a whole bunch of customers and we don't have the infrastructure to deal with it. We find ourselves as a popular product with not enough capacity to provide services. So we need to quickly and efficiently improve the market capability to meet the need. So we want to use funding, goodwill, and uh, collective impact to build up the services that address the, that impact the cost of care the most first. Um, I can tell you it'll be housing, um, but we're not building houses at Dr. Cock. We won't be building any services, but we do as I don't want to uh, trample on the great conversation you had before. There is there is work to be done there. Kaiser has built uh, housing development in Oakland. Denver Health is uh, building a housing department or a housing build, or they're remodeling one. Uh, all but two floors will be uh, low income housing, um, but the other two floors will be for their patients who discharge. Um, I think that's wonderful. I'm not certain that healthcare providers or insurers should be the ones spearheading affordable housing in our region. They don't have a track record of affordability. Okay, so to convene this wellness fund, we would uh, engage stakeholders, and the, uh, the more the merrier, uh, but with, with a focus. And we would have four uh, basic responsibilities. Convene stakeholders, identify the services that need investment, make those investments um, to uh, increase the capacity of community services. We're talking about computers. Um, uh, interoperability, HIPAA certification, and uh, rules and regulations to follow, policies and procedures. And then we would also pay for the delivery of services, uh, a bit of community-based services. So we would also um, purchase meals and rides and any other type of service that would lower the cost of a person's health care. And it always uh, comes down to money. Um, Dr. Cog would like to see investments by the state and health insurance companies because they are the direct beneficiaries of this um, in terms, in financial terms. The real res, uh, res, recipients of the benefit are the individuals. Uh, this will, will lower their out-of-pocket expenses. This will improve, um, I can be a little grandiose and say, it will improve the workforce potential. It will improve school participation. If people aren't struggling with their needs, they will be more engaged in their community. So a wellness fund is an initiative that came about from the Accountable Communities for Health. There's a lot of those nationally. And I wanna tell you about, um, uh, well, I'll tell you about a couple of them. First, um, Washington State has established nine. Uh, they are capitalized, they have a lot of money. They don't really have a solution that they're working on, um, but they have uh, a program. Uh, it's a great place to be as a, as a manager. <laughs> um, uh, Boise, Idaho has the same thing. Their uh, legislature uh, created uh, a wellness fund. Uh, uh, interestingly, the legislature came up with their annual budget for the state and the governor came up with, uh, with theirs and the only difference was the wellness fund um, and it was eventually created. Uh, the one in Imperial County, uh, California, I, I will point out to you because they make 
uh, they have a similar structure. It's one county, uh, it's a pretty rural county, uh, but they have found, the insurance company that uh, um, provided the funding for this found that their doctors were more interested and engaged in the process of getting better at serving the community and serving people with their medical services. Um, and also there's a thing called HEDA scores. I won't c explain that to you because I don't know what it stands for, but it's basically the grades that insurance companies are rated on. Do you get an A, do you get a B, do you get a C? This is the only county where those scores went up and it was because of their wellness fund. Um, and finally, I'll uh, talk to you about our efforts to date and I wanna um, uh, tell you about who's, who's on the team. So uh, I came up with an early version of this. I talked to some folks that I've been working with through the accountable health communities at George Washington University called the Funders Forum. They were one of the original teams that helped uh, incubate the accountable communities for health and then they worked with CMS to develop the accountable health communities. They are now moving on to wellness funds. So I attended that meeting and I got some great um, information on how they're structured, uh, what they're doing. They're mostly clinically based. Ours, ours could be mostly community based. Um, uh, and I want to introduce you to Dr. Mark Levine. Uh, he came to us uh, from uh, through the Accountable Health Community. He's uh, been a great resource. It's nice that Dr. Cog finally has a doctor working for it. Um, oh, sorry, oh. I apologize, I apologize, I apologize. Oh. Has two doctors working for it? Uh, yeah, what do you call a veterinarian that can only work on one species? Doctor? Um, uh, uh, yeah, he, uh, uh, most recently, uh, Dr. Levine, uh, was the chief uh, medical officer for Medicare in the federal region here. So it's odd to describe his job to him as he's sitting here, but he worked, uh, <laughs> he worked just down the street at, uh, at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid as the chief uh, medical officer. He also started his own group practice of uh, doctors and was uh, successful there. And he's, he's a wealth of information and uh, enthusiasm. And he's helped us uh, conceive of a strategy to address this coming tsunami. Uh, Jayla, uh, and Doug and Rich Morrow, who I think you all know. Um, we've all been figuring out how do we engage these initiatives at the state, these healthcare companies, to bring them to the table and say, thank you, but this isn't gonna work. You're building, uh, as I call it, you're building the Autobahn into a brick wall, and they've, they're about five miles from the wall. Um, and so we're, we're trying to engage with them as, as quickly as possible. Um, uh, we've met uh, with uh, some of the governor's staff. Um, we've, uh, we did have a meeting scheduled with the uh, s uh, staff member from the Office of Saving People Money on Healthcare, but uh, the weather intervened. That's been rescheduled. Uh, we'll be meeting with the state Medicaid director and the, uh, some staff from the hospital provider fee, hospital transformation program. Um, and then we'll be uh, doing some further community engagement to build a, a stakeholder group. Any questions? Questions? Oh, Director Atchison. Hey, Jig, in the hospital world, there is a cost to them for readmissions. Yes. Is there any chance that that cost to them could be partially to fund some of this? No. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, I, I'm sorry. The, the penalty um, is so low that it doesn't affect the operations of the hospital. So they'll eat the cost of the penalty to get the admission back. So they get, might have to pay $9,000 on a readmission, but they're still gonna charge 50,000 total for it. I made those numbers up, that's not, that's not real. Yeah, depending. Um, and well, uh, follow up with that, what, what can we, elected officials here at the state level affect that. That if there is a readmission, that we find some way to divert some of that back from the hospital back into something like this wellness fund as a guaranteed revenue stream and that'll help. If they're not readmitting them, that means their health is better. But if they're not doing yeah. the job they should be, then they're back in the hospital probably in a worse condition they were in. Okay. Um, well, there may become a time when we might ask you for a favor, uh, but, but I, th I think it is with regards to a like this. I think as we go forth with this and have a further conversations with um, 
um, with the administration, be honest with you about this. They're intrigued by the concept. Uh, I think, you know, from around the country, we just, I mean, because insurance companies have bought into this concept elsewhere in the country, right? So it only seems reasonable and logical that they would be open to a conversation here. Now, we haven't had those conversations with insurance companies yet. I'm seeing shaking of heads. Um, but we have with, um, with the administration and staff, and they're very intrigued by this. And I think they understand um, the message that we're sending them that this, what they're planning to introduce, what they're going to introduce, is deemed for failure because it's just on the backside, it just can't work, right? I mean, you know, you just can't do it if you, you know, you're just creating longer waiting lists and frustration. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're going to aggressively explore this um, as I've suggested to you uh, throughout the last year, that this is something that this, quite frankly, is the only mechanism that we see. State and federal funding is never going to get us to where we need to be in order to serve our seniors. So we're actively pursuing private sector folks, and we just wanted you to be aware of this latest concept. And we do believe that the Wellness Fund has a lot of potential. But do they need a, an example of a, a life failure right here in Colorado? Well, I mean, I'll go look at the VA. Oh, well, yeah, we've, we've had our own problems with the VA and getting reimbursed, but um, that's an, another issue well, in time. But as far as the funding and, and stuff that you're talking about, that's a good example of what you're continuing to offer services you can't afford to do, not doing them. Therefore, vets are not getting the medical services they need. Well, we'll keep you all abreast of the latest developments with this. We just really wanted to share the information and where we were and make you aware that this, you know, there's this pending doom that's coming related to this. Um, but we'll keep you abreast. Director Shaw. You're such a breath of fresh air, Doug. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I guess my question was about Kaiser. So is Kaiser not only making the referrals to the community services, but funding them because they do okay so they're create they're also creating the problem okay i kind of thought that maybe they created closed loop that they uh, i can't say that they have begun to pay for some medically tailored meals but not many um basically we have a fr in economics we have a free rider program they've been getting these services for free for so long they're just used to it and it's just not a model that works anymore thank you yeah, I actually had the chance to uh, sit in on the, the uh, accountable health uh, community uh, discussions. It went from strategic to uh, to something well beyond my my pay grade, and it was just fantastic to see everybody collaborating. Dr. Levine, he was there, um, had some fantastic perspectives, and to me, um, I just can't wait to see what what's what's going to come out of this. So, um, I guess to be continued. Thank you. Moving on, um, item six, briefing on front range passenger ma rail. Mr. Rieger. Thank you very much, uh, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. So at your last meeting in September, uh, we gave you a briefing and an update on the activities of the Front Range Passenger Rail Commission. Um, in particular, commission staff talked about uh, the large planning effort that the commission has just started uh, relating to a service development plan for Front Range Passenger Rail. So I'm not going to rehash that today, but just as kind of the reminder, as part of that service development plan uh, and project development process, you know, we're going to look at everything you know related to uh, planning for Front Range Passenger Rail. You know, technology, alignment, service characteristics, cost funding but one of those issues that we're also going to look at is the issue of governance you know who's who's going to operate this what is what does a governing structure look like um, and that has implications for funding and it has implications for other things so um, as the Commission has started its work on this and started to dig into uh, this issue of governance uh, there's a few options that have been uh, potential options that have been developed for consideration and that's really what we want to talk about with you today because there are implications uh, for your communities you know there's involvement by local governments um, it's in part a geography conversation um, so we want to bring this to you and sort of explain you know what these different potential options might look like um, and then get your input on 
um, sort of how, you know, how that lands on you and how you might react to those. Um, I will say, um, as Dr. Cog's representative on the commission and the vice chair of the commission, at some point, um, I think sooner than later, we're probably going to take up uh, this issue in terms of a recommendation um, of one of these governance structures. And so, you know, in sort of, you know, casting my vote, so to speak, I want that vote to reflect um, the input that we receive from all of you. So we wanted to bring this to you today, help you understand what they are um, and get your input and reactions to them. Uh, so with that, I'm going to introduce Andy Carcian from CDOT, uh, who's going to come up and walk you through um, each, of the, each of the governance options. Hello everyone, I'm Andy Cartian. I'm the Legislative Liaison for CDOT. We've been involved with the Southwest Chief Front Range Rail Commission uh, from the beginning when it was uh, created by the legislature. They've gotten some funding, as you know, to do this servants development plan. Let me just say, first off, there is no funding for a front range rail. There's no NEPA process. There's no identified corridor, nor stations, nor anything of that nature. This is a first step of a multi-step future possible conversation to have. So what we're talking about now is establishing a kind of a, a opportunity for the legislature to, to understand what we're talking about with passenger rail and develop some options for local governments to create an authority or buy into an opportunity for a passenger rail, be it along the front range, be it up I-70, those kinds of options. We are not going into this conversation with a identified alternative for passenger rail in Colorado. We're nowhere close to that yet. So with all of that said, let's talk about some of the ideas that we've discussed. Option one, all of these are a variety of different options. So option one is the idea of creating a public rail authority statewide. This is very similar to the conversation that you all have been having in regards to EMPOs. The idea would be we create a statutory framework for local governments uh, to join together, create a, a rail authority via resolution, and then those local governments work together to identify funding, identify, you know, help through the NEPA process, do the planning, help out with CDOT, with the commission, and then through that ground up, local government uh, governance structure, they would be able to go to the voters when there is funding available, when there's the, you know, the plan in place, and they would go to the voters for approval of whatever option and whatever best process that these, you know, local governments have come up with. That's a very broad overview of one. On two, basically the same thing, except it's just for front range. This front range rail district, it would be um, include a defined district. So this, the difference on this would be in statute, we would be defining a boundary and that boundary could include all of the counties along front range, right? We don't have a specified boundary right now. Um, but with option two, there would be more specificity in regards to what that rail district would look like. Yesterday, the, um, many of you were in a transportation meeting and we heard pretty loud and clear that any proposed rail district should be a statewide one. Um, we heard that very loud and clear yesterday. So um, take that into consideration as we're talking about this. Number three, what we're looking at here is something similar to what we would have with HPTE now in, at CDOT. We would create an enterprise. It would be within CDOT and it would be focused more on working with public private partnerships in order to establish a front range rail or a rail opportunity uh, within the state of Colorado. You know, this would be working with uh, Amtrak or with other entities uh, that would be bringing funding to the table in order to you know, further passenger rail along the front range or along I-70. And then the final one is the 
That's what I'm looking for. Least ambitious. I don't know if that's the correct way of describing it. Uh, but it would be to create the, the expand the existing commission, which is in statute and essentially was created in order to study the feasibility of, of passenger rail along the front range. That was their mission. That's their vision. That's what the funding was for. And that's what this service development plan will create. So the option number four would be to expand that into a different kind of governance that maybe would allow them to move more towards, uh, you know, than ultimate, uh, you know, maybe along the lines of number one, if we did with option number four, the commission would be the responsible party for gathering the local governments together, convening the, the conversations, establishing that plan as opposed to with option one, it's left up to the local governments as a whole, similar to, you know, as we would with an EMPO or an RTA with a regional transportation authority. That's very broad overview of the four options. I'd much rather hear from you all and hear what you have to say and answer any questions that you all may have. Any questions? Director Jones. So, um, I, I and many of us were at the meeting yesterday and we heard not only that I-70 shouldn't be left behind, but heard some very spirited words from the Speaker of the House, which made it sound like she wasn't even interested in seeing any legislation at all in 2020, which all of this would require. Right. How did you interpret her comments on what she wanted? They, they were spirited and they were, they were forceful. Um, they, and they were open to interpretation. What I heard her say was she did not want to move forward with specificity and that she did not want to see a piece of legislation come forth and say, this shall be the rail corridor, this shall be the boundaries, these shall be the players, and this shall be the funding. And that's fine because we're nowhere near that, right? I mean, you want to... Let me sort of add to that. Um, you know, first, we appreciated her input. It was a good meeting yesterday. It wasn't specifically about this issue, uh, but the issue did come up. We did hear those comments, and we appreciate that. Um, myself, as the vice chair and the chair of the commission, spent a few minutes with her after the meeting, just talking to her a little bit. Um, again, I, I think the bottom line there is that a little bit of a sort of education about the process of what our intentions are, where we're at in the process. Um, again, as Andy said, we're at the very beginning of the process. So I think there's just a little bit of sort of process and, and uh, sort of time understanding of where we're at, what our intentions are and what we're doing. Uh, we hope to follow up in a conversation with her to sit down with her and, and just kind of talk that out a little bit. Um, and I think that greater information education, I think will help us get on the same page of where we're at now and where we think we're going. Um, that said, we did hear her comments, and we want to we want to sort of reflect on that as we move forward. Director Flynn, thank you. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about why is that coming through? Okay, uh, the discussion yesterday about the public rail authority that there was a great uh, uh, more enthusiasm to make that statewide rather than focused and let local governments themselves associate. Uh, given that, at least the way I'm viewing it. Uh, passenger rails on I-25 and on I-70 doesn't really serve the entire state. So what was what was the discussion around there? Yeah, I think in a nutshell, um, so just to clarify the meeting yesterday, just for a little bit of context, it was, um, it was a meeting about sort of transportation funding and different groups working on different ideas around transportation. We had a presentation on the EMPO concept, and then we had a presentation on front range passenger rail. During that conversation, you know, there were some comments about I-70 and the fact that our commission legislatively, and you know, is is legislatively directed to look at the I-25 corridor. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to leave I-70 behind. It doesn't mean we don't want to coordinate with I-70, but we have a legislative mandate uh, to look at the I-25 corridor. We have funding to do this service development plan for front-range passenger rail along the I-25 corridor. That's what we're doing. 
again, that said, you know, we want to look for opportunities, particularly in a governance type option, or the things that we can do that serve that legislative mandate, but don't preclude opportunities, or maybe even foster opportunities for rail in the I-70 corridor, or in the future rail in other parts of the state. And I think that was, that was part of the conversation yesterday. It was an information gathering and education sharing conversation, because some of us are really familiar with this stuff, and some people in the room aren't. Um, and so understanding, you know, why are you doing it this way? What are you looking at? And having that conversation of what are opportunities and what are challenges, that's really what it was about. Does that answer your question, Director Flynn? Yes, somewhat. I, I, I probably should have been there, but I had a conflict. And so I just wanted to understand it a little better. A, a few other considerations on it was, uh, if we do passenger rail along the front range, we don't want to exclude the opportunity of rail going along I-70, because they have right. studied rail going up I-70 as well. And, and, you know, and they've, they've gone down that road, so they want to make sure that technology would be interoperable along both lines, at least to have that conversation um, and not exclude it by having a narrow focus on the on the any right. proposed you know legislation moving forward. Plus, there are other interest groups talking about front ring or rail going up into the mountains um, as well. They don't have as thought out and and uh, thought out. <laughs> proposals. Uh, that, I'm that, glad you thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, there are other advocacy, advocacy groups out there, and there are other local governments along the I-70 corridor that do want to continue to be part of the conversation. So it was much more about not excluding and being inclusive than it was about any other conversation. Okay, I was more curious why statewide, as opposed to the local governments along I-70 forming their own, along with I-25. I don't see why you know, people in Durango or Springfield or Julesburg would would be interested in this. The, and, and most likely they wouldn't be. There may be opportunities if everything works out well, funding comes available, all everything falls into place for spurs, you know, to possibly go out to more rural areas. There have been conversations about that. But again, that's so far into the future then, right. you know, that's... But so as far as statewide goes, I don't think mostly it would be because not to encapsulate all of those rural areas more, it's an easy way to define it as opposed to interstate passenger rail or you know, something okay. like that. Thank you. Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, coincidentally, we will be, the board will be receiving a briefing from the I-70 coalition at our November regular board meeting. A plug. Um, my question is, has the commission taken a preference as to one or m more of the alternates that they they would like to bring forward? Yeah, so when the commission first heard, uh, when we first had this conversation of introducing these options and started talking them through, you know, obviously we didn't take a vote at that time. It was a sort of um, education information sharing. Um, but we did have a conversation about our sort of initial thoughts on on each of these options. So. And that's indicated in in one of the attachments in this item in the in the packet, um, in terms of the commission's sort of preference is too strong a word, but initial leaning, um, perhaps, um, based on that initial conversation, which obviously occurred before yesterday's meeting. But I think it's still consistent in that option one and option two um, had some appeal uh, amongst the commission. Um, option three, uh, the commission again, sort of an initial sense wasn't as um, wasn't as um, enthusiastic about because there are some limitations uh, with option three around a rail enterprise, and then option four, you know, obviously I'm not sure about that. Want to keep it on the table. We didn't want to eliminate anything. We wanted to have these conversations with you and the other front range NPOs. Uh, we'll be having these conversations as well. Um, I'm actually looking at one of our other commissioners, and I'd like to invite Bill Van Meter. I think, were you at that meeting? Um, if you wanted to sort of give your sense, not to put you on the spot. Represented it well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So again, I, I think the point here is we wanted to bring all of them to you and sort of get your input and get your sense on them uh, before the commission did any more with this. Director Shaw. Thank you. I guess I feel like I'm missing something because the last that I heard, we really, there, there were conversations about whether or not it should go through Pueblo or the Springs or, you know, uh, even, the, even the route is, 
is still up in the air and i and i'm trying to figure out why legislative action is is part of the consideration at this stage i i'm just, i don't know you want, sure. you want to take that one i'll take that one. a couple of reasons one it's a governor's priority and so we were asked by the governor to take a look at some of the possibilities of moving a, you know, a passenger rail option forward. Two is if we want to consider this, seriously consider this after the service development plan has been completed, something will have to be done. And so that leads us to wanting to, as a multi-year strategy to keep the idea of passenger rail alive. If the legislature is going to have to ultimately do something we want to keep them involved and keep in the outreach, as was evidenced yesterday with Speaker Becker saying, you know, keep us involved and I want to know what's going on, especially as we get closer to an alignment and a preferred alternative. It's a, it's a very a good way to keep the legislature involved. Even if this, you know, if we go with option one, it doesn't create anything. It's not going to mandate the local governments to determine anything. But as with the Regional Transportation Authority, the option is there, the tool is there for it to be taken advantage of for the counties and the municipalities along the Front Range or along the I-70. So it's more taking the opportunity to educate and, and bring people along with what we're doing and to set up future opportunities for passenger rail. Director Brackett. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, if I could do a follow-up. I, I, I'm still somewhat confused because, so if it, if it doesn't really do anything, why does the legislature need to vote? And local governments are definitely not going to bring the type of money that it sounds like will be needed. So I, I, I'm not, I, I guess I'm, I'm just so unsure of why, why we need this at this stage. I, I understand it's the governor's priority, but unless the governor is proposing funding, I. I feel this is kind of the cart before the horse. And, and I, I understand where you're coming from. Okay. So get funding out of your head. Okay. So erase that yeah. and then we'll have a conversation. So we can't have funding yet because we haven't gone through the NEPA process. Once we start getting into the NEPA process, which this service development plan, which the commission is currently undergoing, once that's completed, we will be able to take on the NEPA process when and if funding becomes available, when there's some other opportunities down the road for that NEPA process to begin. But we're not talking about any funding and we're not talking about any, any formalization of a corridor. All we're talking about is just the one step of, of creating a statutory framework for future opportunities if some funding should come along, if there is a NEPA in the future as opposed to waiting on all of that and then doing something in the future. So it's, a, go, go, please. So, but isn't, isn't the commission already established and don't they already have the authority and the funding to come up with the service plan? And it, it seems at least that we would have the service plan before we would go to this step. Why, why is it important do it differently so the commission was established legislatively to further i think the exact language is something effective further the development of front range passenger rail right from that planning perspective that's really different than being a transit operator obviously that's really different right. than you know the governance around how would a rail system operate what's the authority that would operate and govern that rail system so it's really two different functions we were legislatively mandated on the first function you know we're not there on the second function um, i think andy said it better than i could have but i think just to reiterate the point is that when we get through all the steps that we're just at the beginning of when we get through the service development plan when we get through the nepa project development process when we have those questions answered around cost alignment technology service all of those things we think it would be helpful to have this sort of structure in place rather than leaving all of that work into the end this work here 
doesn't influence, well, it could influence, but really more, it doesn't depend on all of those subsequent steps to follow. It's, it's, it's laying that foundation so that once the, you know, to use this analogy, once the house is built on your foundation, then, you know, then you can sort of react and move forward rather than leaving us to the end. So it, they are kind of separate things, but we're looking at, you know, what's a step that we can start exploring, getting some clarity on the front end so that we're not leaving it all on the back end. Does that make sense? A little. I'm still. I'm still a little. I. I. It still seems premature to me, but I. I do understand what you're saying, and I appreciate that. And, and maybe. Maybe speak to the timeline of the, the service development. Oh sure. Yeah. Um, and I also want to clarify your route question, Director Shaw. But in terms of the timeline, so we kicked off the service development plan work in early September. Um, paired with, so we're using sort of a um, blended approach, so to speak, of where we're gonna step from the service development plan into the federal NEPA EIS process together, because they're very similar. It's, it's somewhat like going from a PEL to a NEPA process on a highway project. So we're gonna do all that work together, um, and I think our total time frame is about 30 months to do sort of step through all of that work. So we're just in the first few months of that. Uh, so we've got a lot of work ahead of us. Again, this is just one of the initial issues that we're starting to tackle, along with you know many other initial issues that we're looking at. Oh, and then also um, Director Shaw's question about the route. Just to clarify a little bit, our legislative our legislative authority says, you know, front range passenger rail along the I-25 corridor. It does su suggest some specific stops, but those are not mandated. Basically, we're looking at almost border to border within Colorado. Uh, specifically, we're looking at Fort Collins to Pueblo. Um, but given the other half of the commission's work on the Southwest Chief, one of the ideas around the Southwest Chief is what would be known as through car service from La Junta to Pueblo up to Colorado Springs and down to Trinidad. The point of that is when you put that together, you start stitching together that passenger rail network from at least Fort Collins down to Pueblo and Trinidad. We also have a contingent from Cheyenne, Wyoming on our, on our commission uh, in a non-voting capacity because Wyoming is really interested in that connection up to Cheyenne. So it's essentially a border to border uh, work, though that could comprise you know, a couple or more different pieces of passenger rail. And maybe it's similar to if a if a couple of local governments wanted to create a special district, but they didn't identify the funding. They don't know what the funding is. They have a vision in in place for a library or for public service, whatever public service the governments want. They'll go to the legislature to create that kind of you know metro improvement district or a X, Y, or Z special district. That's pretty much what we're doing right now. We're creating something for local governments to take advantage of in the future when they want to implement a passenger rail, when all of these steps have taken place, as opposed to you know, doing it later. Does that help? Did that answer it? But Still, okay. Director Brackett. Yeah, yeah. So I just, I would say, I don't think this is just Director Shaw's concern. I mean, I think what the, the, the concerns she's raising to me make a great deal of sense um, because of how early we are in the overall process. Right, so like the, 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 the idea of the Front Range Rail District sounds a little too specific since we don't know where the corridor would be or how far it would stretch, right? So defining a corridor, a, a, gov a governance corridor before you've defined a transportation corridor doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But like, uh, as Director Shar said, like the little, the, the local governments are not the ones that are gonna be able to get Front Range Rail done, right? I mean, it's not it's not like, um, you know, uh, that Lone Tree and Littleton and Boulder together are going to form a special district and build a rail line, right? Absolutely. So right. it's coming from a larger scale than that. So that first thing about, you know, giving local governments the ability to put this together isn't making a lot of sense either. So I, I, I guess the, I, I, I'm not sure why the state isn't continuing to run this for another couple steps before they're turning over you know, hitting the, the governance stage. And I heard all of your explanations and, and that, that concern continues uh, on my part. Because like, once you figured out a corridor, then you might well constitute something that had, you know, representatives from all the different areas that the corridor covers, plus some CDOT people and some state people. And But, but until you know where you're going, so. And I don't know if it's, if it's appropriate or not, but it, it when we passed the Regional Transportation Authority bill, no local governments were ready for a Regional Transportation Authority, and yet that statutory 
language enabled and empowered local governments to get together and create a possible regional transportation authority. Now that's a much smaller district than what we're talking about with rail. The vision, I suppose, would be for option number one is if Larimer, Pueblo, and Denver, and Boulder are very interested in passenger rail, they can start getting together and having some initial conversations based off of the data that we've gotten from the service development plan, bring in the commission, bring in CDOT, bring in Amtrak, RTD, and really start having those conversations towards a specific goal of that. Now, can they do that without legislation? 100%. So this may not pass, this may not be ripe. Um, if it doesn't you know, go forward this year, all of these conversations can continue. We hope that they will continue, and um, you know we'll we'll keep moving forward as far as you know figuring out ways to to develop a passenger rail along in Colorado. But I hear what you're saying. It's it's a big concept for for the future to be laid down right now, especially when there's so much uncertainty about where it would be in the future, or if we'll ever you know see anything in the future of it. I understand that. Any other input or concerns or thoughts? Director Atchison. Kevin, to your point, yesterday, <clears throat> excuse me, yesterday's meeting was the first of that group. They are a spinoff of the governor's policy committee, which some of us sit on. But as far as elected officials that are here tonight, I think Elise and I were the only two in the room. I missed somebody, I apologize, but let's say this came as a spirited discussion, and I mean that with a tongue in cheek. It got some immediate reaction from some of the legislators that uh, felt that they had not been advised that this was coming along. I would just tell you that this thing is a long way from being anywhere done. My opinion, not necessarily the groups, but I think there's a lot of questions that, as you're all asking about that are not ready for prime time. They're not ready to be answered because they don't have the answers. But I think what uh, Andy and, and Jacob are both saying is this is something that's now out. Got a lot of reaction yesterday. I would almost guarantee you it will be on the agenda at the next meeting, which is being scheduled for December. And I think it'll be there for a while. But it did not get a, a lot of, uh, oh, God, let's go do this. <laughs> I didn't get any. <laughs> Because there's just too many unknowns on, about what it is right now. And, and I want to reemphasize that there's a lot of unknowns and you're all absolutely right. And that's part of our message in coming to speak to you is there aren't certain, there's no certain alignment, there's no certain station stops, there's no certain boundaries. And that's the point. So there's a lot of unknowns. This is maybe one attempt to create some clarity within the conversation. Is there anybody on the phone who has a question or comment? None. Um, I think we're done. Thank you so much. Yeah, I just want to say thanks for this conversation. Uh, really appreciate sort of the comments about process, um, education. We'll take that back to the commission. Uh, so thank you very much. And with no further business before the board, we are adjourned at 548. Thank you very much. So perform. Oh. Performance and Engagement Committee, through a meeting in the room next door.